indeed our host for tonight. She is the great, the marvellous, the absolutely delightful Annabel Gerwich, who is an actress, activist and a New York Times bestselling author. Her most recent book, You're Leaving When? Adventures in Downward Mobility, is now out in paperback. It was a New York Times favourite book for healthy living and a Good Morning America must read. Annabelle has been a longtime host of Dinner and a Movie on TBS, a regular commentator on NPR. She co-hosts the Tiny Victories podcast and she is just an all-round fantastic supporter of Speakeasy. Thank you, Annabelle. So without more ado, Annabelle, take it away. Thank you so much much, Amanda and Lucas. You know, I've been so fortunate enough to be part of House of Speaky since back in the city winery days in Tribeca. And with each evening of speakers, I'm reminded of the words that Yi Yang Yi Li uh, invoked of Catherine Mansfield's great phrase when Li wrote, Dear friend, from my life, I write to you in your life. What a long way it is from one life to another. Yet why write if not for that distance? And tonight we get to bridge that distance as we listen together to our wonderful roster of speakers. And I have a thought or two about tonight's theme, Long Strange Trip. When I consider the phrase long strange trip, it conjures vivid images of exotic locales, but the trek that sticks out in my mind as the longest, strangest trip was not a singular journey, but the repeated slog between my home and my kids' high school where I endured five days a week for one and a half years. During the first semester of 11th grade at a highly touted public high school, it became clear that Ezra, my kid, pronouns they, them, theirs, was no longer welcome at the school. This followed in the wake of some laudable questioning of administration policies, some copious drug use, and the only institution where they were going to be able to matriculate was located deep in the San Fernando Valley, an hour's drive from our home, which often stretched into a two-hour crawl across the urban sprawl, and the return trip was sometimes even longer. I would wake up at 6 a.m. to fortify myself by guzzling as many espressos as I could possibly hold down, and we pile into the car and set off for the fledgling charter school they'd be attending, which itself was in its inaugural year and had dubbed itself Valley International Prep, acronym VIP, which I took to calling the Island of Misfit Toys located in a blighted industrial wasteland at the corner of Van Nuys and nowhere. Getting to that location was like a sketch in the Californians on SNL. You take the five north to the 134, to the 101, to the 170, to the 405. It was the kind of mind numbing freeway expedition that Joan Didion described in Play It As It Lays. The last leg of our passage was a stop and go thoroughfare lined with unmarked warehouses, probably housing porn productions, the occasional pawn shop, windowless watering holes, weed dispensaries, old shells of car back seats were propped up on cement blocks abutting chop shops, billboards, advertised bail bonds, and teeth in a day dental implant outlets. Even more grim, the mood inside the car, which was ranging from punishing to penitential. Each morning, I would lower myself into the driver's seat, carefully affecting a neutral fa facial expression, hoping not to incur the wrath of my teenager who was in the throes of the very real existential crisis that is surviving adolescence. And for my trouble, I was rewarded with either a lashing silence or the unleashing of a torrential onslaught of complaints. You're driving too slow. You're driving too fast. Why are you looking at me? Why aren't you looking at me? Your choice of music is wrong. Your fashion sense is disastrous. You're breathing too loudly. Please don't get out of the car. Don't wave at me when I get out. Your very existence is embarrassing. 
Now, often the reward for a difficult journey lay in reaching your destination, but no, the entire enterprise of Valley International Prep, aka Island of Misfit Toys, was a well-intended hot mess. The principal greeting the students at drop-off would hobble to and fro like a battle-weary soldier, mumbling under her breath, but still audibly, what a terrible mistake it was to have started the school. And at the island, someone was always sulking in the hallway, sobbing about their love life, immobilized by some other distracting drama. And that was the instructors. Teachers fled like rats from a sinking ship and the curriculum shifted from week to week to reflect the gap in staffing. And unlike Survivor, you couldn't get voted off the island. And there was no alternative save homeschooling. Now, I had gone to college in an acting conservatory, so all I would be able to pass along to my offspring was the ability to cry on cue, which does seem to have some application in today's world, but as I've discovered, is not applicable to every situation a person encounters in life. What kept me going was that there was an ending inside. I believed that on that day, in the hopefully not too distant future, my child would be launched and I would know it was all worth it. I'd kick back and sigh, my work is done. And now it is six years later, those long strange trips are in the rear view mirror. They graduated from Bard College, they are five years sober, but I will never get that time back. And I'm convinced that this crease just above my eyebrow was indelibly etched into my forehead during those hours of trying to keep my eyes focused on the road. And for my fellow travelers, parents of young adults waylaid by the virus, whose children like mine have returned home to their childhood bedrooms, that destination is, if it is even exists, further off now, as far off as the horizon perhaps even further, although I have no idea what that would mean. But just last week, Ezra and I piled into the car on an early morning hours to load up the vehicle to move them so they could take up residence with their partner in a neighborhood in a different zip code. And along the route, we listened, we listened to music together. It was a composition of their own making, so I fixed my face and to that neutral configuration because even though I loved it, it might be worrisome to have your mother find your music be so appealing. So I complimented them without going completely all Jewish mother on them. And they bounded inside the building, toting a favorite lamp that I hadn't realized they had spirited away from my living room. And I luxuriated for one moment in that glorious parental moment of grace and then my phone rang. Mom, if you haven't left yet, could you drive me to work today? Yes, if we are lucky as parents, there is always another long, strange trip lurking just around the corner. <laughs>